Hello, hand rolls and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Wikipedia clickhole adventure in your quest to be the most interesting party guest in 2021. Last week we went from hentai to a possibly dead writer, so who knows where we'll go this time. Today we're going to start with a random article, but do drop a comment below if you'd like to make a suggestion of a topic to start with next time. Here we go. Hold on to your panties. <laughs> Welcome to Clickhole Wednesday, a casual hump day hangout that takes less time to edit than my other shit. The Caribbean Dove, a species of bird in the family Columbidae. Found in the Caymans, Colombia, Honduras, Jamaica, and Mexico. It has been introduced to New Providence in the Bahamas. He looks pissed. That is one angry dove. I don't think this particular dove is um, used when talking about peace because he ain't happy. In the 18th century, the Caribbean dove was described under the name white-bellied dove by several naturalists, including John Ray. And that's pretty much it. It's the dove of the Caribbean. And um, despite living in apparently paradise, that is one unhappy bird. Seriously though, look at that face. That is, that is not a happy bird. I think I'm gonna go to Ambergris Key solely because I think ambergris is something really nasty. I think it's something to do with whales, but I can't remember what, and I think it's made into perfume. So we're gonna go there and see if we can make our way to whatever the hell that is. Ambergris Key is the largest island of Belize. It's about 25 miles long and one mile wide. Where it has not been modified by man, it is mostly a ring of white sand beach around a mangrove swamp in the center. Oh, mostly a ring of white sand beach. That sounds terrible. Who would want that? A Maya community lived on the island in pre-Columbian times and made distinctive red ceramics. San Pedro town is the largest settlement and only town on Ambergris. There are also some small villages and resorts. Played hosts the first season of Temptation Island in 2000. Oh my God, it's commonly referred to as Isla Bonita after Madonna's song in 1987 mentioned a place called San Pedro. That's right. Oh my God, that's what this is. Yes, I suppose Isla Bonita has more of a ring to it than Ambergris Key. That is definitely more singable. Because of the island's small size, the main form of powered transportation is by golf cart. Wouldn't that be great to live somewhere where everybody drives a golf cart? What is road rage like in a place that only drives golf carts, I wonder? Is it just passive aggressive? Because you could really take a swing at somebody from a golf cart. Oh yes, these are the pictures I wanted. I came here for something weird coming out of a whale and um, I went to vacation instead. Hell yeah, that is good. I am there right now. Ooh, secret beach. That's exciting. The majority of the island is reserved for national park slash wildlife preserve, limiting the availability of real estate. The Belize secret beach destination on Ambergris Key is often called San Pedro's worst kept secret, as the secret beach area has yet to see substantial development, but has become an increasingly popular destination for tourists and locals, allowing the area to boast a remote atmosphere, but still offer more developed amenities. Wow, wait, can we see a picture of it? I gotta look up a picture of it. Uh, yeah, it is a badly kept secret with over a thousand reviews and it looks like it's quite developed. Remote my ass, hidden beach. Oh, this, oh, it's, it's badly kept secret. That is for damn sure. It's got restaurants on it. That's being developed, man. I don't know what they're on about. Yeah, the pictures are just of businesses and food. There's not even a picture of the beach. How do I get to the bloody, the, the, the whale thing? I thought I would have somewhere to go from here, but I don't. Well, let's compare it to the one in Turks and Caicos. Okay, it's in Turks and Caicos. Ambergris Key is a private residential island. Oh, who lives there? Here it is. The island was named for ambergris, a waxy substance that migrating sperm whales regurgitate and is prized as a fixative for perfume and cosmetic products. I knew it was something nasty that we used in perfume from whales, because I'm just a treasure chest of disgusting knowledge at this point. Ambergris used to wash up along the eight miles of the island's shoreline, but is rarely found on the island today. And that's why it's now residential, because the smelly waxy vomit of sperm whales no longer washes up there. How fortunate for them. It is known for its turquoise and shallow waters. I am sold. Pictures? No, no pictures, just this one. Okay, that's fine. Not that I'm milking this for travel fantasies or anything, but you know. Ooh, there is a native iguana. 
He looks cool. What else is there? Most importantly, the island is a significant habitat for Turk's head cacti, the cactus species from which the name of Turks and Caicos Islands derives. The cactus is known for its similarity to the Turkish hat fez, and is therefore called the Turk's head or cap. Oh, like the little red hat. Oh, it does have a fez. <laughs> It's got a fez on! Oh my god, that's really cute. Turk's cap cactus, or mellow cactus, or melon cactus, blimey, is a genus of cactus with about 30 to 40 species. There are lots of hat-wearing cacti in the uh, Caribbean, I did not know that. The 1905 Vienna Botanical Congress, why we can't click on that, I am severely devastated. I truly want to know all the drama that goes down at the annual Vienna Botanical Congress. Anyway, apparently they rejected the name Cactus, so this name was not available. I don't know what that means. Oh my gosh, is that's the fruit. That's the mellow cactus. The fez produces fruit, apparently. They are edible. Well, now you know. If you find a cactus with a hat, just wait long enough and you can eat its fruit. Very exciting. Let's learn about the fez hat. The fez, also called tarbouche in Arabic, is a felt headdress in the shape of a short cylindrical peakless hat, usually red and sometimes with a tassel attached to the top. The name Fez refers to the Moroccan city of Fez, where the dye to colour the hat was extracted from crimson berries. Modern Fez owes much of its popularity to the Ottoman era. The origins of the Fez are unclear, and there are different theories. One of them is that the Fez may have originated in the Balkans, Greece, or in Morocco, and subsequently spread to other places by the Ottoman Empire. Initially, it was a red, white, or black bonnet over which you wrapped a turban. Later, the turban was eliminated, the bonnet was shortened, and the colour was fixed to red. The fez was easier to wear because Muslims put their heads to the ground during prayers and they were able to do it because it was not a headdress with a brim. In 1826, the Sultan began sweeping reforms of the military and the new modernised military adopted Western style uniforms, but they saved their fez. I mean, it's weird, right? I'm really interested in military uniforms of old because it just doesn't look practical for, you know, a physical activity like killing people. Do you know what I mean? All these tassels and buttons and the, the pants and this hat. I mean, what if it falls off? Do you have to pick it back up and put it back on your head? It doesn't seem that convenient to wear. Also, doesn't the um small red hat make a particularly critical point on the body a target? Hey, the Ottomans were successful. Clearly it didn't matter, but well, they were successful for a time. Then they weren't. But before that, they seemed to do fine with the fez. I just think it's a huge mistake. There's a reason why we all wear camo now. Anyway, so the Sultan in 1827 ordered 50,000 fezes from Tunis for the troops. Two years later, he ordered his civil servants to wear it as well and banned the wearing of turbans with the intention to coerce the populace at large to update to the fez. Why did this stop? Why did the whole universal hat thing stop? You know? Hats were a ubiquitous style across nations and civilizations, but now it's like you just wear whatever hat and often you don't wear one at all. The plan was successful, everybody upgraded to the fez, a radically egalitarian measure. Tradesmen and artisans generally rejected the fez, but it became a symbol of modernity throughout the Near East, inspiring similar decrees in other nations. Styles soon multiplied. Ooh, different styles of fez. I thought the whole point was that it was uniform. So initially they dyed it red using extract of cornell, which is some kind of flowering plant or berry it looks like. But because they had so many, they had to switch to a low cost synthetic dye. So production shifted to the Czech Republic, which was then a part of the Austrian Empire. In 1908, the Austro-Hungarian annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina resulted in a boycott of Austrian goods, which became known as the Fez boycott, due to the near monopoly the Austrians then had on the production of the hat. Although the headdress survived, the year-long boycott brought the end of its universality in the Ottoman Empire, as other styles had become socially acceptable. That's interesting. The boycott of Austrian goods resulted in the demise of the universal fez. Interesting that the fez was a symbol not only of Ottoman uh, affiliation, but also of religious adherence to Islam, when it was also the main headdress for Christians and Jews during the Ottoman Empire. Jewish men wore the fez and referred to it by the Arabic name Tarbush, 
and even in South Asia, the fez was adopted. Seen as exotic and romantic in the West, it enjoyed a vogue as part of men's luxury smoking outfit in the United States and the United Kingdom in the decades surrounding the turn of the 20th century. Oh yeah, that's that's when everybody kind of romanticized the East and uh, you know, we now call that cultural appropriation, but it was a thing. And then a new guy in Turkey in 1925 banned the fez. So initially they banned all other hats and only allowed the fez and then and then less than, less than a hundred years later? Yeah, roughly a hundred years later, it was like 1820s, 1925, the fez was banned in Turkey. It's a hat, guys. I think there are more important things to worry about, but these were not the concerns of the time. Yeah, funny, it's mostly been a military hat. It just looks like a giant target. It is a pretty iconic hat though. It looks kind of futuristic if you think about it because it's so simple. Many fraternal orders are known for wearing fezes. There's a fraternal order called the Improved Benelephant and Protective Order of Elks of the World. Is, is that real? Oh, it is. Wow, okay. There's also the Loyal Order of Moose. That looks legit. The Loyal Order of Moose. <laughs> and look at it. Just look at the Loyal Order of Moose. That looks really um elegant. Who do I want to click on? I need to click on both. I don't know how to do this. Okay, I hope we can go from here back to Elks of the World because I gotta click on Loyal Order of Moose. The Loyal Order of Moose is a fraternal and service organization founded in 1888 and headquartered in Moose Heart, Illinois. Moose International supports the operation of Moose Heart Child City and School, a thousand acre community for children and teens in need. Oh, shit, this is nice. I can't make fun of this. Oh, additionally, the Moose organization conducts numerous sports and recreational programs. Oh, I thought it was just some one building weird offshoot thing. Oh no, it's very established and they do good things apparently. The Loyal Order of Moose was founded in Louisville, Kentucky in the spring of 1888. It was originally intended as a men's social club and it spread throughout the Midwest. The early order was not prosperous and Dr. Wilson, the founder, was very dissatisfied and left. The entire membership is sometimes referred to as the Moose Domain. As of 2013, they have 800,000 members. Wow, it's a lot bigger than, I thought it was literally that one building in that picture. The Gustin Kenny incident. That sounds like something from South Park. Moose rituals took a tragic turn on July 24th, 1913, when two candidates for membership, Donald A. Kenny and Christopher Gustin, died during an incident at their initiation ceremony in Birmingham, Alabama. Both men were made to look upon a red hot emblem of the order and then blindfolded and disrobed and have a chilled rubber version of the emblem applied to their chests while a magneto was attached to their legs and an electric current was applied to them by a wire to their shoulders. The aim was evidently to make them believe they were being branded. Both men fainted, but as it was thought they were feigning, the lodge officers did not stop the initiation till it was evident that the two were dying and the lodge physician was unable to revive them. I have many questions. Do we not know what actually killed them then? That's strange. The Moose distributed a recruiting video filmed in 2000 called Unbelievably Cool. Is it on YouTube? It might be. Yes, it's here. Working two jobs is really getting to me. Bachelor, yes. Happy, I'm not so sure about. You guys really saw grim. You never seem down. What's your secret? James has a big fat <laughs> Maybe I do have a secret. My Moose Lodge. That's unbelievably cool. Yeah, well, it's there. You can watch it. Notable Moose members. Oh, four presidents have been Moose. Harding, the two Roosevelts, and Truman. But there's no third party source to that, so maybe not. Who else? Who else has been there? There's a number of uh, past and current folks who are Moose. What about entertainers? Charlie Chaplin was a Moose. Larry Bird was a Moose. My gosh. Loads of Moose. Way more Moose than I expected. Moose is starting to sound like a word that doesn't exist to me. I've said it so much recording this. Let's see, what do you have to do to be a member? Until at least the 1970s, membership was restricted to white men of sound mind and body in good standing in the community, engaged in lawful business who are able to speak and write the English language. So what is the requirement now? Do you still have to be a white man? Maybe. It's a shame there's no link to the elk. That is a bummer. Manute, Manute Ball? Let's go with Manute. I feel like it's gonna be Manute. Manute Ball, NBA's tallest ever player, was a moose. Let's learn about him. How did he end up being a moose? How tall is he? Seven foot seven. And he's only 200 pounds? Isn't like an average six foot guy like 170? Over one and a half extra feet only adds like 30 pounds? Are you kidding? 
He must be really skinny. Sudanese-born American professional basketball player and political activist. He was listed seven foot six in some places. I mean, what's the difference between seven foot six and seven foot seven? I don't think there is one. He's one of the tallest players in the history of the NBA. As of 2020, he ranked second in NBA history in blocked shots per game and 16th in total blocked shots. I'm shocked he wasn't first. At that height, he was notable for his efforts to promote human rights in his native Sudan, aid for Sudanese refugees. Is he dead? Oh, he is. Oh no, he died at 47. Why? Okay, hold on, let's learn about him. He was born in what is now South Sudan. Oh, his, oh, he's from the Dinka tribe. They're really tall. They're super tall people. His name means special blessing. He had no formal record of his birth date. What did they put? October 16th. Did they just pick that randomly? Does he just get to pick? That's kind of exciting. His family were extraordinarily tall. His mother was six foot 10. His father was shorter, six foot eight. Sister, six foot eight. And his great grandfather was seven foot 10. Wow. Yeah, the Dinka and the Nilotic people of which they are a part are among the tallest populations in the world. I was born in a village where you cannot measure yourself, Bull reflected. I learned I was seven foot seven in 1979 when I was grown. I was about 18 or 19. When you grow up around people that tall and then you meet literally anybody else, is it really weird to realize you're the, you're the tallest person around? It must be kind of strange. I suppose they regard other people as really small. He abandoned playing soccer because he was too tall for it, but in his later teens, he picked up basketball in Sudan, but he experienced prejudice from the Northern Sudanese majority. Oh dear. Ball first landed in Cleveland. The LA Clippers drafted him in 1983. Lynam, who is the Clippers head coach at the time. Lynam said, one of the things everyone was looking at was his passport. His passport said he was 19 years old. His passport also said he was five foot two. When Lynam asked Ball about the discrepancy between his real height and his passport height, Ball said he had been sitting down when measured by Sudanese officials. <laughs> Why? Why would they measure a man sitting down? Okay, so he played for the Washington Bullets, the Golden State Warriors, Philadelphia 76ers, Miami Heat, Washington B Bullets again, Philadelphia 76ers again, then the Golden State Warriors. Wow, he was busy man. His arm span was eight foot six. That's the longest in NBA history. His upwards reach was 10 foot five. On average, he blocked one shot per every 5.6 minutes of playing time but his other basketball skills were very limited. His rail-thin physique made it difficult for him to establish position against the league's bulkier centers and power forwards. And he also suffered from a claw hand. What's that? Oh, okay. Oh, so he couldn't handle the ball very well because his fingers curled in. Oh, that's a shame. Off the court, he had a reputation as a practical joker. Charles Barkley was a frequent victim of his pranks, including calling Warriors teammate Chris Mullin chalk because he was clearly quite white. But he developed such a close friendship with him that he named one of his sons after him. That's nice. He was reportedly short-tempered and sensitive to the frequent remarks or questions about his extreme height. On one occasion when an elderly woman in an airport approached the towering Ball and asked, how tall are you? Ball angrily retorted, I didn't ask you how fat you are. <laughs> Brutal. It must get, it must get tiring though. It's never felt so good to be average. As of 2020, Ball remains first in career blocks per 48 minutes, almost 50% beyond second place, second in career blocks per game average, 16th in total block shots, and the only player in NBA history to have more blocked shots than points scored. That's still a win. <laughs> okay, humanitarian efforts. He spent much of the money he made during his NBA career supporting various causes related to Sudan. He frequently visited refugee camps where he was treated like royalty. He had a one day contract with the Indianapolis Ice of the Central Hockey League. He couldn't skate, but the publicity generated by his single game appearance helped raise money to assist children in Sudan. He also suited up as a horse jockey for similar reasons. That horse must have been like, you must be kidding me, mate, I'm gonna be riding you. He advocated for reconciliation efforts. God, he was a busy man. He had six children with his first wife and four with his second wife. Jeez. Despite initially knowing little English or Western culture upon arriving in the US, Ball adjusted and was widely regarded as well-rounded, inquisitive, and well-read. As seen in 2010, he died from kidney failure, complications from Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Oh, it's a skin reaction. Ooh, horrible. He died in Charlottesville, Virginia and is buried in South Sudan. Oh my God. Dang, that is intense. A short but very rich life. 
in sport and philanthropy. Let's check out the Dinka people. They do have extraordinary physique. So they are a Nilotic ethnic group native to South Sudan with a sizable diaspora population abroad. The Dinka mostly live along the Nile. They mainly practice traditional agriculture and pastoralism, relying on cattle husbandry as a matter of cultural pride, not as a source of commercial profit or meat, but as a means to perform cultural demonstrations, rituals, marriage dowries, and milk feedings for people of all ages. There are about 4.5 million people constituting about 18% of the 2008 Sudan population. They are believed to be the tallest people in Africa. Average height is almost six feet, five foot 11.9. The name of their language means people. Imagine saying you speak people, it's kind of poetic. Age is an important factor in Dinka culture, with young men being inducted into adulthood through an initiation ordeal which includes marking the forehead with a sharp object. Ow. Also during the ceremony, they acquire a second cow color name. Hmm. The Dinka believe they derive religious power from nature and the world around them rather than from a religious tome. Notable Dinka. Oh, Alec Weck. She was like a 90s supermodel. Let's check her out. South Sudanese British model and designer who began her fashion career at the age of 18 in 1995. She has been hailed for her influence on the perception of beauty in the fashion industry. She is from the Dinka ethnic group, but fled to Britain in 1991 to escape the civil war in Sudan. Yeah, she really stood out in the 90s catalogues, which were like vanilla central. And then there was this tall, bald African woman in their midst. She was born in a two bedroom house without electricity or running water and is the seventh of nine children. Her mother was a housewife and her father was an education official. Her name reportedly means black spotted cow. Oh, but she's shorter than the average, five foot 11. That's amazing if that's considered short for your people. That's insane. She was the first African model to appear on the cover of Elle. She's been in music videos, Golden Eye by Tina Turner and Got Till It's Gone by Janet Jackson. Next to nothing is known about her personal life these days, but at least up until July 2012, she was working a lot. The UN Refugee Agency and also, like Manu Tebol, on uh, issues relating to her home country. Interesting that the two Dinka people we looked at both passionately returned to helping their homeland. Let's see where she's from. Wow. Don't know how to pronounce it. So Wow is a city in northwestern South Sudan, the bank of the Jewel River. It's about 400 miles northwest of the capital. It's a culturally, ethnically, and linguistically diverse urban center and trading hub. It is also the former headquarters of the Western Bar al Ghazal. What's that? It's a state. Headquarters of a state? Like government headquarters? Don't know what that means. Gosh, it's had a lot of war. It seems very ethnically diverse. Lots of different people live there. Due to its diversity, WoW has repeatedly suffered from ethnic violence. Well, that sucks. Major contributors to the local economy are banks, a couple of universities, airport, government, radio and satellite. And the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia is expected shortly. It's got a cathedral and a national park. Ooh, it is hot all year. What's the coldest it's been? Nine degrees Celsius, 49 Fahrenheit, roughly. <laughs> That's the coldest it's ever been there. Wild. Well, let's end this click hole here. We started this click hole with Caribbean Dove, which doesn't look like it has any interest in peace whatsoever. And we ended it in South Sudan, in the third largest city called Wow. On the way, we checked out Ambergris Key, which we initially clicked on in search for whale excrement. From there, we enjoyed a cactus with a hat and then actually looked at the history of that hat, which was far more interesting than I expected. And then onto the loyal order of moose, which wears said hat. We went onto a famous moose, Manute Bol, who is from the Dinka ethnic group in Sudan. And then we learned some more about his people and the 1990 supermodel Alec Weck, who is also a Dinka. If you enjoyed this click haul, please don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Let's me know you're digging the random stream of trivia. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.